Ladies and gentlemen, nice to see you all back from the coffee break. Hopefully bright-eyed and bushy-tailed from that little shot of caffeine you got. My name is Paul Srauceps, and I've been asked by the organizers to lead this discussion on the theme of the relevance of international law in crisis situations. Uh, over the next three days, you will be discussing and during this conference what is right and what is legal. But as we heard in the previous panel, that's not always the most important thing. And the intersection of law and power really determines how international law, international norms are applied and what they mean in praxis in practice. And, because, and I think that there's no person in Latvia, perhaps, who is more qualified to talk about these issues than the person I will be discussing them with, which is our foreign minister, Edgar Srinkevich. He has extremely wide-ranging experience in various positions where he has had to deal with these issues every day. From 1997 to 2008, he was the State Secretary of the Ministry of Defense, and we know that those were times when international law was very much in the forefront of discussions after the 9-11 attacks and the wars in the Middle East. He also organized the NATO conference in Riga in 2006, which perhaps is not a signal uh, event regarding international law, but nevertheless, I think the international law touched on these on the conference in very many ways. From 2008 to 2011, he was the chief of staff of the president of Latvia. Again, a very tense time, and since 2011, he's been foreign minister of Latvia. Uh, we have about an hour, because at 12.45, there's going to be a family picture of the participants of the conference. Uh, I think we'll talk about half an hour between ourselves, and then afterwards, I'll open the floor to questions. I know uh, legal scholars and, and and jurists are people who are eager to discuss and to talk, so I hope we'll, uh, you'll have questions for Mr. Minkiewicz. To start off the discussion, however, I want to touch on an issue that has been brought up already, uh, both by Ms. Liebing Egner and in the, in the first panel discussion. Uh, last month, in August, Latvia celebrated the 25th anniversary of the regaining, the reestablishment of Latvian independence. And of course, that word itself the reestablishment carries with it implicitly the idea that Latvia as a legal entity existed during the whole period of Soviet occupation. Uh, this is, in many ways, and it was mentioned in the panel, can be seen as a victory of international law. And I'd like to ask Mr. Minkiewicz for some reflections on the importance of international law for Latvia in this previous period and also about the relevance of this precedent and what uh, and this achievement today, Mr. Nkevich. Well, uh, thank you very much, uh, Paul, for this very kind introduction, and thank you very much mentioning that I'm really qualified to talk to this distinguished audience because I'm not a lawyer. And to talk about the international law, not being lawyer, it's uh, to some extent quite a challenge, but probably also provides a bit uh, different perspective. And um, coming back to the question you raised, uh, I think that it is really remarkable that Baltic states and Latvia that were occupied back in 1940 by the Soviet Union that uh, actually lost its independence de facto uh, has always maintained the Euro independence. Our occupation was never recognized by majority of international community and actually it was very helpful back in 1980s when the some call it singing revolutions uh, we call here in Latvia that's awakening period when we were fighting for our independence then actually it was much easier for our politicians for our leaders at that time to go around the European countries, to the United States, and to fight for the recognition of uh, the independence movement for uh, putting additional pressure towards the 
then Soviet leadership. And then it was relatively very, very easy to get uh, recognition by uh, many uh, European uh, countries. Actually, it is also remarkable that as we speak, we celebrate 25th anniversary of de facto restoration of independence, but also de facto restoration of uh, diplomatic relations with uh, many countries. What are the implications now? I think that to some extent uh, we see that, uh, yes, it takes time, sometimes even 50 years, for international law to prevail, for the law to prevail, for, for justice to prevail. And I think this is something that, uh, unfortunately, again, uh, at least one country can learn, and that country is Ukraine. Uh, what happened two years ago, the illegal annexation of Crimea, that is not recognized again by international community, there is specific resolution of the United Nations General Assembly. That is something that uh, is probably the only most powerful legal and moral tool to fight for territorial integri uh, integrity of the country, to actually fight for the prevalence of international law. Sanctions, diplomatic efforts are, of course, very important. But as our history shows that if international community is persistent, if country is persistent, then ultimately, sooner or later, uh, those legal principles, the international law prevails. But I'm a journalist, and as you know, from your experience, journalists tend to be impatient. And people are also impatient. They say, well, you know, it's two years have gone by, and what are you doing to make sure that these international norms are enforced? Uh, well, politicians are always impatient, too. And, of course, we always want to see that uh, things develop quickly. Uh, however, uh, however, I think that uh, so far those uh, steps that were made immediately after March 2014 uh, first of all, very strong condemnation by the European Union, by the United States, then the appropriate vote in the United Nations General Assembly that actually gathered around 100 UN member states voting for the appropriate resolution calling for the uh, observation of uh, territorial integrity of, of Ukraine. Those, those are powerful foundations, economic sanctions, sanctions against uh, certain uh, persons in Russia that uh, are enforced and will be enforced, uh, I think, for a long time vis-a-vis -vis legal annexation of Crimea. It's a second thing. But then, yes, we are excluding military means mm -hmm. for many reasons. I don't want even to go to details to address this issue. But then I think that what is very important, that both when it comes to uh, diplomacy, diplomatic efforts, all the bilateral, multilateral engagements with Russian Federation and international fora. We keep reminding about Crimea, we keep reminding about the status of Crimean Tatars now in, 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 in Crimea, that this is not kind of disappearing. Unfortunately, yes, I see that from time to time there are my colleagues who are saying, Crimea, let's forget it for now, let's deal with immediate problems in eastern Ukraine, and maybe it will come back. As with Baltic states, uh, that was not the subject number one in the negotiations between the United States and Soviet Union or Soviet Union and other countries. But it was kept on the agenda. It was kept through proclamations by U.S. presidents, by keeping open uh, Latvian, Estonian, Lithuanian embassies in, in the United States, by proclamations of captive nations, by leaders meeting. In this respect, it's a bit different. What we need to do is to uh, push that this issue is always on the agenda of relevant international organizations in bilateral contexts, to keep up with sanction policy that we have developed for non-recognition of Crimea, and, of course, also to keep fighting those small steps that are very important for, for the human rights, for national minority rights in Crimea and so on. And unfortunately, yes, it will take time, even if we all would like to see as in a good movie, that two-thirds of the movie, which lasts around two hours or so, uh, all the bad guys are, are prevailing, and then in the 
last minutes, everything gets back in place. Everyone is happy and there is happy ending. There will be happy ending, but not, not in two hours. Okay. Uh, I want to open up the themes and ask you a very broad question. In the previous discussion, we heard uh, from Judge Crawford about how international law experts should regard their profession as in the degree to which they, uh, they can have influence on decisions. As one of the people who sits in European Union, foreign ministers' councils, who takes decisions on tough questions that have to do with international law, for instance, recently a treaty with Turkey on the refugee crisis, how do you see the impact of international law in that decision-making process? Well, uh, it depends. It depends what subject you are debating. For instance, on migration, I think that one major issue for all of us in the European Union, and in a broader sense, was, of course, the obligations that every nation has under international law when it comes to the refugees, to the uh, obligation to grant asylum to those who are in need. I think that this was number one issue. Then you can, of course, debate uh, about economic migration versus those people who are really fleeing war zones, conflict zones, and who are really entitled to have this. And then, of course, you have all the other issues, like uh, how well our borders are protected, how well asylum policies are working in different EU member states, and so on. When it comes to the decision-making, that is probably not even more attributable to you, but I would say to NATO, I think we are now confronted by a whole range of new challenges. We are talking a lot about hybrid warfare, cyber defense, uh, information warfare, or propaganda, and then we see that actually there is huge gap, let's say, between the actual challenges and uh, what actually the international norms and standards are. Take a cyber defense. Uh, we had a debate in NATO last uh, year. We approved uh, the NATO strategy on, on tackling the hybrid warfare. And in cyber defense, what would be the measured response, for instance, if uh, we detect that there has been state-sponsored major cyber attack against critical infrastructure of the other country as a result of which people have died. Let's assume that uh, aviation security has been endangered and a couple of planes as a result actually went down and, and there are casualties. What is the proportional measure? To attack in the cyber space the critical infrastructure of that country or actually to use military force? How you apply international law in this respect, what is the measured response? The same on propaganda uh, issues. We know that there are at least two types of very dangerous kind of, let's say, instruments. The first, state-sponsored, state-guided, state-actually uh, mandated information channels uh, that, in my opinion, is everything but media. So. Do we have the right, actually, not to apply media freedom principles we have in the relevant European conventions or international law, or we still try to find kind of measured way? And then it's, again, about uh, those terrorist extremist groups that are using, by the way, very well social media to uh, promote their case. Do we have adequate international standards? or they are just developing through both, through relevant UN Security Council resolutions, and then we have our own RIGA protocol as the supplementary protocol to the European uh, Council Convention on the Fight Against Terrorism, where we are developing some kind of regional and, 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 and also national response. So those are issues that we are sometimes debating, how far you can make your decisions both at NATO and the EU level, and how far they would correspond with, with, with what we have now. Mm -hmm. So, but in these meetings, do you have ministers say, no, the treaty is this, or the relevant decision by an international court is this, and so we have to follow this policy, or is it basically a dis discussion about power that then where the treaties get aligned to fit with your decision? It's, uh, if, if you talk about the EU, I hope that I will not offend many lawyers here, then we have fun because we have three legal services, that of the Council, that of the Parliament, and that of the Commission. Yeah. 
Ministers do not debate. Sometimes we just try to, to figure out who is right. <laughs> you pointed to a number of uh, areas that are not covered right now by international law, cyber warfare, uh, this information warfare. Do you see a, a will to come together and have, make some agreements about these, or is this going to be solved ad hoc? We just saw uh, a report in the Washington Post about the uh, possibility that Russia is trying to interfere with the U.S. election system. Obama said, don't do that. We have ways of responding. Uh, that seems to be a very kind of playground kind of response to this. There's no, there doesn't seem to be a structure for it. Do you see some kind of uh, readiness to create that kind of structure? Uh, well, I see the real willingness and interest to develop norms, or at least to apply the existing norms when it comes to cyber security. Mm -hmm. I think that to some extent uh, NATO Center of Excellence on Cyber Defense that is working and, and operating in Estonia is trying to address some of those issues. They have published uh, some good analysis. Of course, not legally binding, they are trying to apply the current uh, international law, Geneva Conventions and so on, 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 on this, and they try to, to, to work on this. Uh, Yes, I see that to some extent there is an interest to look into matter deeply and to understand uh, what are the gaps. Uh, for instance, uh, between the current regulation and the new set of challenges we are seeing. Uh, for instance, uh, there have been some of member states in the European Union. Um, I, I still remember that my Danish colleague was calling both in public as well as in the meeting for revision of uh, relevant United Nations conventions on migration and refugees. Uh, so there is, there is still scattered but still uh, attempt uh, to raise not only you know, immediate operational concerns, what we are going to do in that or in other respect, but also what would be the proper legal framework. But then, uh, well, I think it will take time uh, to develop uh, relevant, uh, relevant issues. For instance, we have been many times also, we are now the member of the United Nations Human Rights Council. We have been also active participant in the Online Freedom Coalition. So what we have been actually kind of debating for years already, how much uh, the normal media regulation, free media and free speech principles would apply to the online mm -hmm. kind of space, cyberspace, where you have countries that uh, really don't much uh, regulate that and you have countries that actually are almost, uh, you know, switching off the internet to some extent. And this is again another issue, another theme where you have to, where you have to understand where your principles you developed over decades or even centuries would apply when it comes to the, the new technologies. You mentioned the Danish initiative on uh, international agreements on refugees. What do you think the status is of the present agreements taking into account that we see that Schengen doesn't seem to be working right now. Uh, there are problems with the, the implementation of the Convention on Refugees with, with regard to returning them to their uh, countries of origin and so forth. What's the status now and what do you think should be done? Well, uh, I think that uh, we had already numerous discussions on this since, since last year. And I think that we are still going to have huge discussion in upcoming EU uh, meeting in uh, Bratislava, the first meeting at 27, not at 28, which is then very informal, no binding. And I think that uh, the current status after the initial shock of the last year, when I think nobody was frankly prepared to handle the situation be it European institutions or member states, and what we got was the kind of shouting match or the megaphone diplomacy within the EU, that uh, to some extent we are coming to some basic agreements. The first is that, uh, yes, uh, the major issue of Schengen was that, uh, like with many of EU projects, 
those projects have not been created as complete projects. If you have uh, free space to move, then at least the external borders should be guarded properly and according to one standard. We are coming to agreements that actually it is very difficult now to see that uh, taking into account that migration has been the kind of national responsibility. Uh, if you look at statistics, we have uh, quite a difference when it comes to the consideration of uh, applications of asylum seekers. There are 80% of approval ratings and 80% of rejection, almost on the same on the same issue. So I think that there is some understanding that uh, we should look at more uniform approach, but then there is also understanding that uh, unfortunately uh, also the current framework uh, is not working mm -hmm. and then the major disagreement starts mm -hmm. from those on one side, from those who uh, want to have fully closed borders, which is impossible, and on the other hand, there are those who, of course, say that we have so many obligations to let everyone in. So we have, to some extent, I would say, the pause, because this year is much better off, much calmer than the previous one. But the key issues are still being debated, and the key issues of the common EU policy the probable revision of international law to some extent, engagement with third countries, assistance to many countries outside of Europe, those are still still debated. And to some extent, I would say that security issues in the broadest sense for EU citizens after terror attacks, after migration, after what's happening in our eastern and southern neighborhood are becoming number one. And to find the proper response which corresponds with principles of humanity, international on one hand, but also on the protection of our citizens, that's a key challenge. Mm -hmm. Regarding systems that by and large have worked, uh, regulating international trade, or to take a completely different area, the European Court of Human Rights, we see these being eroded as well. The backlash against globalization that we're seeing in many Western countries, how big a threat do you think that is? to the system of international law that we see in a broader sense uh, because it creates a desire to withdraw from various instruments and agreements. Well, it is, and it is a very serious uh, threat, and I think that it is a serious threat at, at both, actually at even three levels, mm -hmm. global, regional, and national. Uh, I am rather disappointed to see that, for instance, uh, we are not able to agree uh, on uh, the new commissioner for human rights on the Ombudsman of Media Freedom uh, in OEC framework. Uh, like it or not, we can always criticize international organizations. We can always want to do them more, but still instruments like ODIR, like uh, commissioner for, or High Commissioner for Human uh, for, for national minorities of OEC, uh, media ombudsmen, those are unique capabilities and institutions that are observing the implementation of, well, norms and principles we have agreed. We have seen to some extent also that uh, there are countries that now try to appoint the judges to the uh, European Court of Human Rights that would probably uh, we'll look not so much what the law says or what convention says, but what government of their own respective country thinks they should, that should say. So at the regional level, yes, now after Crimea, after this tension we have got in Europe, I am rather worried about the uh, ability of some of European, pan-European institutions to work, even as they used to work a couple of years ago. So that's a serious issue. At the national level, well, every country, I think, that and you represent so many, you can find some examples where there have been some great ideas how to probably address that or another issue that is very controversial. In France, we just had this huge debate about, uh, uh, about using of uh, certain swimwear 
on the beach. Here we have sometimes also uh, ideas of what we should uh, regulate uh, or what we should ratify or what we shouldn't ratify as the convention, that or another. And on the global level, yes, there is some erosion also of um, the ability of, of, of international institutions to monitor uh, to, to monitor the international law and, and order, and I think that this is a very, very worrying tendency. In the previous discussions, people mentioned also that international law has to do with economics. We've seen an economic crisis, and there's a great deal of dissatisfaction with the development, at least in some parts of Western societies, of their economies. Uh, and, as I mentioned, there's a backlash against globalization and against international trade treaties. Uh, your observations about that? I mean, there's, uh, do you think it's possible that we won't see an agreement with Canada, we won't see TTIP, we won't, all these things will just go uh, overboard? Well, I don't know. <laughs> yeah. I think that, uh, I think that we all understand from the kind of rational point of view that it is in the interest of, let's say, United States and Europe to have TTIP. Mm -hmm. It is in the interest of Canada and European Union to have CETA. Then we have, of course, the big elephant in the room that, surprisingly enough, has not been mentioned yet, mm -hmm. at least in our conversation. That's a Brexit and how this is going to affect uh, the trade deals mm -hmm. uh, between EU and uh, United States or what is going to be the future model of relations mm -hmm. between the United Kingdom and, and EU. And of course we see that, uh, unfortunately, as it always happens, uh, and we do not learn from history, and uh, every generation keeps repeating mistakes. Uh, uh, for instance, uh, 15, 20 years ago, we were all thinking that uh, Internet is now going to be the revolution in the economy. To some extent, yes. But when the bubble was over, then we understood that still, we need to address many issues. The same is globalization. At some point, we all are enjoying you no know, travel and, and, and trade, but on the other hand, the number of people who are negatively affected by that is growing. Mm -hmm. And of course, they are very right to raise their concerns. And of course, uh, the negotiations on, on TTIP, we hold the presidency of the European Union, last year, so uh, I was also chairing the Foreign Trade Council twice. We were enormously happy that in the half of year time we got the agreement on two sentences among 28, but still we had to, to get the kind of agreement also with the United States mm -hmm. on many issues. Uh, so that's a very low process, but I think that at the end of the day, like it or not, we need to work uh, and we need to do our best to have this trade deal because ultimately, if properly concluded, it will help to everyone, also those who are not feeling good about globalization. But on the other hand, what I'm also worried, which is not probably the issue for the kind of legal debate, that Internet, uh, social media, uh, also the globalization has produced a new phenomenon which sometimes is called the kind of post-factual society. People not anymore believe to the media, to journalists who are making fact-checking check and who say that that or another politician candidate is wrong and is lying. They really believe what they see on, on, on Twitter, they really believe what they see on social media, and they really believe that if somebody even put strong facts saying that TTIP is bad because it, we will lose jobs and, and, and we will lose everything. And actually people don't believe any more to the analysis and facts. So emotions are taking precedent over rational thing. And I think that it's an issue we will have to deal for, for quite time before we, we get a proper response to all those myths starting from TTIP and CETA to, to I don't know, to how we are dealing with uh, migration, refugees, so, and so on. It's an important issue for journalists who are, care about facts and for lawyers who care about rational argument. I think that's a very, very pertinent point. I was saving Brexit sort of for the end, um, because I know you just came from a seminar, a Latin government seminar, about how 
uh, Latvia should respond to this and what its position should be. Considering that Brexit is, above all, a reassertion of national sovereignty in many ways over international commitments, what's your feeling? Do you think that this process, if it keeps going forward, can take place within a framework of international law, or do you think at some point there may be a breakdown, even, even in this process of disengaging the UK from the EU, if that's the end result? Well, I think that would be a great question to my colleague from the United Kingdom, mm -hmm. because I think that they are still trying to figure out what the Brexit means, mm -hmm. like we try to figure out what the Brexit means. You know, I was really happy to read a couple of weeks ago that one of my most favorite uh, films I sometimes quote, yes, minister and yes, prime minister, that uh, authors of, of, of that uh, really great piece coming out of the 1980s, they just wrote the kind of scenario for another, uh, let's say, uh, issue that uh, would call what, what the Brexit is about and there is a great dialogue between the minister and Sir Humphrey where they start that Brexit means Brexit and they end that Brexit means Brexit and in the middle they discuss that what it means to regain sovereignty so control over the borders but actually Britain has already control over its borders because it's not part of Schengen so whenever you enter UK you present your passport <clears throat> then uh, about the certain exemption in the European law, but Britain has the most exemptions already, so they end up that actually Britain has everything it wants already. Uh, so we are going to enter into the very interesting discussion. We are now waiting for the proposals from British government. We are already formulating what our response would be. Uh, and our, our government, we had just really very good discussion this morning. Uh, we kind of reaffirmed that we don't want anyone to be pushed. We understand that UK needs some time. We have our core interests. We want to have UK as close to European Union as possible, not only when it comes to single market, but also when it comes to foreign and security policy, decision-making, cooperation within the home and justice affairs, uh, yes, the status of our own uh, compatriots in, uh, in UK is of utmost importance. Uh, so we, do, we know what we want. We still don't know what Britain wants. But we are ready to, to, to engage in meaningful debate when the country is, is ready to start negotiations. But I think that, like it or not, it will, of course, create new legal norms and mechanisms. Uh, and maybe even more unique than we know currently as EU law or EU uh, Swiss cooperation and legal framework between uh, uh, European free trade area or uh, European economic uh, zone and so on. And finally, to end our little discussion before I open up the floor to questions and comments, uh, your comments, we're talking about the problems and, and, and uh, insufficiencies of international law, our, our discussion is, uh, and the whole conference is taking place under the sign of crisis. We heard about disillusionment close to what was experienced in Europe in the, at the end of the 30s with international law and the discussion of the previous panel. What, if anything, gives you optimism or hope or sort of the resilience uh, to say that things can continue and won't and we can overcome this period of, of uh, problems and crises? Well, I think that one thing which is very important, uh, and actually it comes to the political class, uh, there is a lot of temptation, and we have seen in, in some past elections, and unfortunately I'm afraid that we are in the period of very important elections in Europe and in the United States ahead of us, uh, like Germany, France, the Netherlands, uh, next year, United States later this uh, year, I think it is very important that we do not compromise when it comes to political issues, we do not compromise on basic principles. Even those who tried in the past elections to, to do that, they actually lost, they didn't keep their momentum. Second, uh, yes, I do believe that there is one bastion that can be very, very instrumental, and that's 
both national courts and also the international court system. Uh, because even if there is sometimes temptation in many countries to, to change laws, constitutions, or, or, or to influence that or another issue, still uh, national court system, constitutional courts, European Court of Human Rights, or international Court of Justice and so on, they may play a critical role actually sometimes really to level uh, out uh, to, to balance uh, the kind of, you know, uh, issues and still many of uh, many of uh, politicians, even extreme politicians, do do consider courts as very important uh, instruments. And I think that courts sometimes can have. I say I don't want to say that now we can extremely rely on lawyers that they will now be correcting everything that politicians do wrong, especially the courts. But I say that actually uh, maybe courts uh, would play in, 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 in coming years even more critical role as, 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 as in the past. And look, we had the ruling of the Constitutional Court in Austria annulling actually the results of elections, which I think is uh, per se very good thing that courts didn't look from the political point of view, but from the point of view of law. But then also we have courts that are overturning some of, uh, some of uh, well, attempts in some of other EU countries to, uh, to gain more political control over media or over the court system. And I think that this is something where, where this instrument may be very, very important in coming, coming years or even probably decades. Okay, thank you. I'll open the floor to questions and comments. We have microphones on both sides of the... So please, there, first question there. Mars Lennox, University of Latvia. Of course, I could have possibility to ask this question uh, to the minister, but uh, using possibility that minister is sitting in front of such an audience, I would like to ask a question uh, about... Well, you know that Latvia as a state is in one club with such superpowers as Russia and United States, or in one boat, and meaning that boat or club is state which does not recognize compulsory jurisdiction of International Court of Justice. So my question to the minister is, uh, is there any particular political reasoning behind that, that more than 25 years Latvia is not recognizing compulsory jurisdiction of International Court of Justice, or that is such a, just an incident? Thank you. Well, I try to use my old trick to, 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 to take some three, four questions and then to skip answering those that I really don't like. <laughs> Unfortunately, <laughs> Paul is not letting me off the hook. Uh, well, you see, there is no particular political reason. Uh, we are still working with Ministry of Justice, and I think that at some point in time we will join, and we will leave the club of superpowers. <laughs> <laughs> Questions, comments? There's no one wanting. Pierre D'Argent from Louvain University. Uh, Minister, uh, you spoke about Brexit and TTIP. Let's face it, TTIP is dead, nearly. Uh, or not, I'm, 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 I'm not saying this is my favorite outcome, but is, this, is the following scenario discussed among your peers? Britain gets out of the Union, negotiate a trade agreement with the Union in order for British goods to access the common market. And later on, Britain concludes an investment treaty with the US. As a result, American investments flow to the UK, stop there for a while, refuel, and go to the union market freely. Is that a scenario that is currently envisaged? And Britain wins at the end of the game. <laughs> uh, well, First of all, I would disagree at this time that TTIP is dead. I would say that TTIP is put on the life support for time being. 
unfortunately. But uh, here, uh, for for a number of good reasons, and I think that uh, EU is you shouldn't be proud of the way how we were addressing this as well because we have so many problems back at every capital starting from investor to, to, to state uh, relations and disputes ending with labor uh, code and, and, and so many vested uh, interests that frankly at the European level even if we have been able to write great mandate, we have not been able to agree on the core interests of the Union as a whole. That's the first issue. Now we see, of course, that in the, US, in the United States, in the political debate, free trade agreements are not the most popular ones. Actually, they get uh, a lot of criticism from both sides of, of the debate or, or the campaign. But still, I think that uh, at some point in time, when the dust settles, we may come back to this uh, idea of probably revised mandate, uh, revised level of ambition and, and to, to work for that. Uh, but uh, about the possibility of how the United Kingdom could probably use the Brexit to conclude not only trade and investment agreement with the UK, but with China, with uh, uh, with, with uh, different countries, I think that here uh, you can't exclude uh, any scenario right now because, as I said, my feeling at this point in time is that there is a serious work ongoing in London to try to formulate what are the core interests when it comes to uh, the negotiations with the EU after triggering Article 50. And then uh, how much, and that I think is the key point, how much they really want to keep access to the European market and then everything else. Because if you look at the trade statistics, it's of course very good to talk about uh, trade relations with Australia, New Zealand, uh, United States. But at the end of the day, it's geography stupid. And still, uh, still you have your major markets in Europe. So I think that uh, this is going to be a very tough uh, process of negotiations. I think that there will be a lot of uh, trade-offs and compromises made on both sides. And I think that one of issues that could actually happen, but it may change, so don't quote me after one year from now saying that I said this and I will frankly uh, will be in a stupid position to, die, to deny everything and say that I didn't mean what I said. But in this respect, I think that we will get into a situation where at the end of the day, there will be a deal about UK's access to the single market, a special relationship, but then there will be very serious constraints on the rights of the United Kingdom to make separate deals that would be in that or another way contrary to the basic European principles. I think that could be uh, the part of the deal. And then, of course, you have this most difficult issue about the free movement of, of people, of, of labor. That could be, I think, one of another very, very difficult issues. But um, as, as one of our colleagues today said in the cabinet, and I can agree with that, uh, two months after referendum, we have more questions and they are still coming in than we have answers. And I think that it's going to, to be the case for coming year or so because now when you look at complexity of the whole issue, be it trade, social security, health, justice and so on, you see that uh, obviously this divorce process is going to be very, very difficult. It's good for you. As a good lawyers, you can always get benefit from divorces, especially as complex as this one. Yes, uh, thank you very much um, for uh, the discussion. Um, in fact, it inspired um, and using the opportunity that we have the minister who is uh, negotiating uh, with all of the other ministers of the EU, I would like to actually get your sense on solidarity. 
Um, and what I mean uh, is the following. So in your assessment, you know, going through these rounds and rounds of formal, uh, less formal, informal meetings, because I know that you're flying all, all over, uh, over these months, um, what is the willingness um, and the ability um, of the uh, uh, European Union, the 27, I should say, um, to work together? Because sometimes you get the feeling, uh, for, for lawyers especially, we get the feeling that depending on what issue, uh, if it's Ukraine, then there is a group of states pulling one direction. If it is uh, Mediterranean, then there is a group of states pulling the other direction. So that's why the question on willingness and the ability of the EU member states to, in fact, work together in finding um, the, the solutions to the crisis within the existing legal frame or creating new one if, if uh, uh, necessary. And linked to that uh, is a bigger question that is also on the agenda uh, of our conference, that is, um, how do you see and what's your feel the other ministers see the role of the European Union um, in relation to, in fact, strengthening the international legal system as such, globally, strengthening its universality. We've already referred to that in the, in the opening discussion. Is there any uh, a, a sort of yeah, acknowledgement that as leaders, as the ministers of foreign affairs responsible for the foreign affairs altogether uh, of the European Union, that you have a certain responsibility also uh, to promote, you know, that value, international law as a value, as uh, universally um, applicable, hopefully. Thanks. Well, thank you. The first question about kind of, you know, ability to agree and, and to move forward and to make decisions. Well, you know, I, in October, it, I, will, I will have the fifth anniversary of being the foreign minister. And if four years I saw that it is really bad and it's a weakness of the European Union that we have, you know, this kind of grouping that we have certain group of countries that are caring about what's happening in East and pushing for strong policies vis-a-vis, -vis, for instance, Russia when it comes to what happened and what is still happening in, in Ukraine. Or we have groups in the South that are saying, forget about the East, let's concentrate mm -hmm. on, on the South. Uh, then now I think that actually to some extent this kind of group leadership that there are groups of countries putting on the table and pushing that issues are not being taken off the table. And it's actually good for the whole EU. Because at the end of the day, we manage to, with, of course, some difficulty and, of course, with some uh, even, uh, I would say, uh, emotion, but we still manage to, to agree on common policy. It's never going to be Latvia's way, or Estonia's way, or, or Polish way. But it's always not the way that some other countries are advocating. So we get to the kind of common, common understanding. And again, it goes back also to the issues that are being presented as very important by countries in the South. And frankly, I think that both have been right. Uh, we were warning about situation in the East for many years. Those countries were warning uh, for many years about the situation in the South. And now when we have both crises hitting at the same time, we all of a sudden understand that we both were right and we actually need to listen and to act uh, more when it comes to foreign policy. And frankly, uh, regardless of all those uh, statements, interviews before any council we have by, by prime ministers, foreign ministers, when we sit in the room, we manage to get uh, kind of uh, decisions that uh, we make as a common decisions. The only problem where I really see there are huge disagreements and probably they will stay for a while, it's Middle East peace process. 
that's where historically countries have taken so different positions that it's almost impossible to to have a common EU stance. So from that point of view, yes, I, I was disappointed. I was frustrated many weeks and months of how we operate. But then somehow, since last year, since the beginning of, of this year, I, I come to the conclusion that actually, to some extent, it's a strength that there are countries that are pushing for issues not to disappear or, or to be put on the table. And uh, you know, our point of view is the Greek or, or Cypriot colleague on many issues is, is very similar. Uh, we sometimes can disagree even in the Nordic Baltic setting on some issues. So this is not so clear cut as sometimes it seems. Having said that, of course, it takes a lot of effort, a lot of patience, uh, of, uh, especially for the high representative of, of, of foreign policy, on the presidency, to reach that consensus. On the second question, well, I think that to some extent, let's face it, can you name, apart from the European Union, uh, any uh, organization, or even if we speak about countries, any country that has been so uh, actively engaged in promoting international law, human rights, development assistance, uh, that is putting uh, issues on the table when it comes to bilateral contacts to the annoyance of many of our partners. Because when you speak with countries in different regions, okay, okay, you want again to speak about human rights, let's, let's put one sentence in the press release and forget it. And EU is pushing for that, for the universality of human rights, rule of law, democracy, territorial integrity, not only when it comes to Ukraine, but also in other parts of the world. Uh, yes, sometimes uh, for those who are idealists, we seem to compromise. Sometimes we, we do understand that just megaphone diplomacy is not the best way to, to, to really improve the situation. I have chaired during the presidency many councils with many countries outside of EU where we were spending even hours debating that or another issue. And still we were refraining from sharp public comments because we understood that at the end of the day that would create more problems and, and, and that would be actually regress rather than progress. So I think that uh, what we do really in all those international forums in bilateral contacts is, is, is a good job. But then let's not forget that in many international organizations EU still is not a full-fledged participant. We have observer status in UN, we have whatever status in many other organizations, and that impairs uh, the EU's ability to act as one, and then still member states are in the driving seat in, in many organizations where you can really influence some of, some of thinking, some of development. We have, I think, two more questions. I'll take them together, and then we can have some there, and then if you could hand the microphone back to the lady back here. Back yeah. Yes, certainly. Thank you. Um, I greatly enjoy your conversation. My name is Bode Jarnaide, I come from Budapest, and I will raise an abstract question. Assume in another continent than Europe, there is a country from which four million people have to flee. It's about solidarity and refugees. Four million people have to flee. In your view, if there was no Geneva Convention, there was no European asylum key, who should provide protection to that four million people? Is it the neighboring countries, some of the neighboring countries, would you see that as a regional problem? That is, that region should provide protection? Or do you think that there is a need for a global answer to that? And I ask that in light of the 19th of September high-level UN meeting, which will deal with this question, and which are not answered by the EU at the moment. OK, and if we, back there. Eva Kalnina, Levy Government Caller, Geneva. And I had a follow-up question to the previous two questions, in fact. You mentioned the TTIP and the um, investor state dispute settlement mechanism in some of the um, investment treaties. And I was wondering, well, clearly the EU has recently taken a lot of incentive initiatives, excuse me, to um, in the field. Um, one of these main initiatives is really 
requiring the member states to terminate the intra-EU BITs. So, um, in fact, it has initiated proceedings against five member states and I believe in formal uh, scolding to at least 20 others. So my question was, first of all, what is Latvia doing with its intra-EU BITs? And secondly, and this is a bit as a follow-up to Ineta's question, is there any solidarity in the way the EU member states are trying to respond to these demands of the EU in this field, which at least in my personal view are really quite outrageous, but that's my personal view. But whatever the EU is saying, be it about the EU investment court, be it about the investor state, the special mechanisms, what is the member state reaction and what can be done? So perhaps if you could give the behind the scenes look on, on, on what's actually going on and what's the power of the member states to respond to EU's demands. I'm sorry, can you clarify a little bit the first question? Um, somehow acoustics are that I, I didn't catch the, the first question. Whether Latvia is, in, is trying to terminate the intra-EU BITs, the bilateral investment treaties that yep. it has concluded with other EU countries because the EU's view is that it's incompatible with the common market and discriminates against um, other member mm. states. Well, thank you. Um, uh, you have five minutes. <laughs> Okay, uh, if five minutes, then I will try to stick to the to the first question about uh, about the four million people all of suddenly uh, moving and who should be the responsible one. Well, you see, there are different intelligence assessments that actually. Uh, in Africa, you can have around 10 million people ready to move at some point in time uh, for different reasons. Uh, and then you have different uh, analysis. Uh, but I think that uh, this is, uh, this is uh, where I would say that, like it or not, but the principal responsible organization is United Nations. You can't simply expect that the burden will be shared only by neighboring countries, only by, if that's close to EU, that the EU then has, uh, has the uh, obligation to, to receive all of them. So it should be then a very coordinated response. And sometimes I get a little bit frustrated to hear criticism from some countries that don't do anything about migration but they are very loud to criticize everybody else. And when asked why, do, why you don't take that or another issue, then you get all the responses you normally hear now in media. But I think that uh, if theoretically there is a crisis somewhere with millions of people, then the only uh, real mechanism would be UN with the balanced approach by regional actors, neighboring countries, um, also, that would require enormous financial effort because not all of them could be moved. Maybe we should speak about also some limited military operations. So that, that would be then something we should look at in a more detailed way. On the bilateral investment agreements, that's a good, that's a good question. Actually, Latvia has uh, some dozens of, of uh, investment protection agreements that we signed before entering EU. And uh, well, we have also some well-known, some not so well-known cases where we are still disputing some of, uh, uh, some of uh, problems with investors as, as they see and as, as government normally denies everything. But, uh, but I think that uh, we would be interested uh, that we really eliminate uh, those intra-EU uh, investment protection agreements, but then it must be done in well-coordinated way and led by, uh, by the Commission. That wouldn't be the process where we, let's say, uh, say that no agreements are in force anymore, but still some countries do have them. Uh, however, I believe also that uh, 
this is something where we also should take a close look because we don't have only intra-EU agreements but also agreements with some countries outside of EU because again those agreements are in force if they have been signed before the country joined EU. And then I think that also better coordination could happen. At the same time, I would like to conclude uh, saying that, you know, uh, this is going to be probably now an issue number one in coming weeks and months, uh, how you actually work with investors in the EU, with outside investors after the now already famous the Commission's ruling on Apple and Ireland. And I think that this is something that we should all watch carefully because, well, obviously there is going to be a court case, but uh, this is something that may set a new era also when it comes to, to this part of, of European law and not only. Thank you, Mr. Rinkevich. We've come to the end of our discussion. I hope it's been interesting for you. It's been very interesting for me, and I think that it's certainly valuable for everyone to see how this law plays out in, from the perspective of the people who actually have to apply it or not apply it, as the case may be. Uh, the discussion has come to the end. We're ending a little early because right now there has to be time to take a family photo, and so I'd like to in, uh, invite the ESL board members uh, Mr. Ulrich, Mr. Lovinch, Mr. Rinkevich, Ms. Liebenegner to go outside and have their picture taken. In 15 minutes, I understand lunch will begin, and then we hope to see you all in the sessions at 2.30, right? No, one, yeah, 2.30. Very good. Thank you very much.